So I would uh, now like to introduce you to our keynote speaker today, uh, Dr. Kenneth Chapman. Dr. Chapman is a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto and is an internationally respected researcher in the field of asthma and airway diseases. Dr. Chapman is also the director of Alpha One Canada Registry. Please help me welcome Dr. Chapman. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you this morning and look forward to spending at least half the day here um, meeting some old friends and I hope making some new ones. Um, interesting for Angela to say, and I think quite aptly, that this is a community. A uh, community of people who are affected by a relatively rare disorder, which means the responsibility for you to, you, does that mean the microphone needs to come up? Talk to those guys back there. They're, they're running the whole thing. The, uh, the, uh, uh, a major burden falls upon you to learn more about this disease, because I'll let you in on a little secret before I get to my slides. Talk to those folks, would you? The, the <laughs> I'm tempted to do without the microphone and just shout. Um, if it's a common problem that you go to your doctor for, high blood pressure, would you like it up? Would you like the handheld? That's perfect. But what's it done to my tie? <laughs> if it's high blood pressure you're going to your doctor for, then you can be pretty sure your family doctor, your specialist has been to courses, learned about it, has been updated. I gotta tell you, your doctor, when it comes to Alpha One, probably hasn't heard about this since medical school which means you're going to have to know a whole lot about it. By the way, when I say that, I mean even the lung specialist won't know very much about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. They may not have seen it before. They certainly are unlikely to have treated it before. So more than any other disease I can think of, except perhaps some other very rare diseases, you're going to have to know a lot about what's going on. So unapologetically, I'm going to give you a talk that I often give to doctors. Brace yourselves, it's full of graphs and p-values and things. You're, you're taking notes, aren't you? You're reaching for a pen, you're gonna take notes. This is good, there will be a quiz afterwards. <laughs> but I wanna cover two really important trends that we're looking at. One is about alpha specifically, augmentation therapy, and the other is about COPD in general. And I hope it gives you, if you have lung involvement with alpha, a couple of action points to pursue. So, we always start these days with disclosures. So, we've thanked people who have sponsored this meeting. Now I'll point out that I have done consultations with research sponsored by and lectures in venues put together by a number of really dodgy people, commercial entities which for all you know might have influenced what I'm about to say. So I'll just point out that all of the major Producers of augmentation therapy, Griffles who are sponsoring here, CSL, Bering, Baxter, Kamada, um, appear somewhere on that list and I think I've worked with them all. And by and large, everybody's trying to do the same thing, is to bring augmentation therapy, this intravenous therapy, to people who need it. So they're listed there as potential conflicts, but I think we're actually all on the same side of this discussion. Here's what I plan to cover. I want to talk about augmentation therapy, and in case you're very, very new to all of this, that's the intravenous treatment where doctors try to boost the blood levels of the protein that isn't there in sufficient amounts. An update because there have been some major trials recently, including an extension of what's called the rapid trial, and if you don't know what that is, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I've been given the placebo slide clicker. Oh, wait, COPD update, I knew that. And I want to step back for a little minute and be a bit of a lung doctor and talk about COPD generally, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. As you know, alpha-1 emphysema is a very, very specific kind of COPD. There have been a lot of changes 
in COPD treatment over the last five years. And I want to review some of that with you and talk about some of those inhaled medications you've been getting or perhaps haven't been getting because you really do need to look at that very carefully. Have we overlooked some of the good new bronchodilators? I think we have. Have we overused inhaled steroids? I think we definitely have. And when I say that, I'm talking about trends that all lung doctors are talking about. So we'll get at the end of the lecture to what's an alpha patient to do with this information. A couple of caveats. First of all, I'm um, going to be talking about intravenous treatment, and I'm going to be talking with information that was developed by a couple of different companies, and you're going to see some different names there. In Canada, there's one augmentation treatment that's been approved by Health Canada, and it's called Prolastin, made by Griffles. There may be others in the future, and you will see some of those other names. For the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to treat it as if it's all the same intravenous treatment, and most of us think it's all pretty similar in most respects. I need a stronger thumb. Um, I'll be talking only about lung disease because after all I'm a lung doctor. Good news is there will be other presentations through the day. I'll be followed by Dr. Wong who's going to be talking about liver disease and there are some exciting new developments with that. We're collaborating with Dr. Wong on those developments. And I'll point out that although I'm talking in general terms from the best trials we've got, alpha-1 disease is a little bit different in everybody. And some of the general principles I might describe to you may not apply in your particular case. So at the end of it all, you need to talk to your own doctor about things. I know that there's some people who are coming up to their first meeting, so I was going to start at the very beginning, how this whole disease area became recognized and how it developed. It began with two very clever Swedish biochemists called Lorel and Ericsson working in the 1960s, the early 1960s in Sweden. And they were analyzing blood using what was then a state-of-the-art technology. It was protein electrophoresis to understand the components of blood in people's bloodstreams. And they were testing samples sent to them from all over Sweden. The, there are two rows there, black blobs. The bottom row shows us a blood sample from a healthy individual. And you notice that the blobs that are identified here with staining of protein are labeled up at the top, gamma and so on. And there's the alpha-1 band, which appears right there in the healthy individual. But every once in a while, Lorella and Erickson would get a sample that looked like the one at the top, and there was no alpha-1 band. Many of us would just look at that, shrug, and move on to the next sample. But they were clever enough to say, what's that all about? And when they tracked it back, they found that these blood samples tended to come from people with emphysema, emphysema that was a bit mysterious because it was occurring in relatively young individuals and individuals who hadn't necessarily smoked very much. So after a lot of study, they realized that the people who were deficient were out there in the population in fairly large numbers in Scandinavia, one in 1,500 to one in 4,000 individuals. They could identify the protein very clearly. We now describe it by weight. It's a 52 kilo Dalton protein. It's produced by the hepatocytes, which is doctor speak for, produced in the liver. So by the way, that's the other site of difficulty for alpha-1, and that's the next lecture. And what they realized, of course, their initial hunch was correct. People who were low in this protein didn't have good protection for their lungs. They tended to get emphysema. Now I say tended, it's not inevitable, but the tendency is a very strong one. So what we're looking at or talking about is illustrated very nicely by these photographs. It probably looks to you, if you're not a physician or a nurse or somebody who looks at this sort of stuff often, like a sponge. On the left, what you're looking at is a healthy bit of dense sponge that is lung tissue. 
And all of those little bubbles, those alveoli, are places where oxygen and carbon dioxide get exchanged. And that dense sponge does a very good job of it. But on the right, that very loose, airy sponge, well, that's an emphysematous lung. And that's what happens in alpha-1 antitrypsin. The lung gets digested by some of its own um, uh, white blood cell proteins. Alpha-1 antitrypsin, if it's there in good amounts, should prevent that, but that's what can happen if the uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin protein isn't present in proper amount. Bear that picture in mind, that picture of low lung density. It's um, um, something that we are using now very, very much in our research trials. So, it seems an obvious thing. The bloodstream should have reasonable amounts of this alpha-1 antitrypsin protein in it. Some people have low levels. Could we purify this protein from blood donations and infuse it into people who don't have enough? And this is a very early graph. I warned you there were graphs coming from the NHLBI or the NH NIH group in the United States. They took purified alpha-1 antitrypsin protein they infused it in individuals. And what you're looking at is a tracing over several weeks of blood levels as individuals received this important protein. That horizontal line is what everybody thinks is the protective threshold for alpha-1 antitrypsin protein. It's 11 micromoles, in case you're interested. And what you're looking at down here at the beginning of the trial are the very low levels of individuals who were part of the study. They received infusions, their levels went way up, but they gradually degraded the protein and lost it by the end of the week, and they had another infusion, and so on. And with these studies, they came up with the standard dosing, which is 60 milligrams per kilogram of body weight infused once a week. That is what keeps the protein above the protective threshold. And they did some other fancy studies and they could show that this protein reached the lung, the place where it was supposed to be doing its business. So the protein became available in Canada. Augmentation therapy was a prescribable therapy in Canada in the mid to late 1980s. It's been around for more than a quarter of a century. I'll point out that until about four or five years ago, I was still receiving referrals from lung specialists trained and working in Canada, unaware that augmentation therapy was a prescription that they could write. They still thought that augmentation therapy was something that was only available as part of a research trial. Part of the reason for that, and this is an important bit of history, is in 1989, Wise individuals from the Canadian Thoracic Society got together to look at this new treatment, this augmentation treatment, to discuss what they thought about it. And the quick story is it had been evaluated by blood specialists as a safe blood product, but the lung doctors hadn't been involved. Maybe they had, oh, maybe they were a little annoyed by that. But at any rate, they said, you know, it may be safe, it may get into the bloodstream, but doggone it, we're not sure it's actually doing what it's supposed to. We're not sure it's preventing emphysema. We want a trial, which sounds reasonable enough. Now the problem is emphysema develops very slowly over decades. And the tools we have to measure emphysema are actually kind of crude. We're going to talk, for example, about spirometry. And I'm sure anybody in this room who's being treated or has been evaluated for a lung problem has had spirometry. It's actually a 200-year-old technique. People blow in a measuring device, and we measure how much air comes out and how quickly it comes out. It's as simple as that. It's not very precise. It's not very sensitive. So let's go back to the Canadian Thoracic Society. They said, we'd like to see that spirometry is preserved in people who get the intravenous treatment as compared to people who don't. A standard research trial. Sounds pretty good. I have to tell you that before anybody undertakes a research trial, they plan it very carefully these days and they say, 
how many people do we have to study and how long do we have to study them to get to a clear answer. We talk about statistical significance or these mysterious things called p-values. So the idea is we find people with alpha-1, a little round circle at the left. We encourage them to participate in a trial. We say, some of you, we don't know who, we're going to flip a coin, we'll get augmentation therapy. Some of you are just going to get some intravenous saline, nothing in it at all, placebo, and we'll keep track. Sounds pretty simple. And then you do the numerical calculations. If you're using that spirometry that lung doctors are familiar with, that crude 200-year-old technique, turns out you need about 500 people in each of the treatment arms studied for about five years. That's nearly impossible to do. It was certainly impossible in the 1980s. Nobody had 1,000 patients, uh, let alone 1,000 patients who were willing to participate in such a trial let alone enough money and resources to actually do the trial. In fact, to this date, 25 years later, the largest randomized controlled research trial ever done in alpha has been the RAPID trial. The RAPID trial is here. I don't know if you've ever done this, but if you're ever interested in participating in research, you should be able to find a brief description of a research trial posted on one of the international websites for research trials. This one is the famous one, clinicaltrials.gov, and the rapid trial was um, posted there. I'm going to highlight a couple of dates for you. The rapid trial has completed now, and I'm talking about the two-year portion of the rapid trial. It was filed with clinicaltrials.gov in 2005, and it was a complete trial in 2012. In other words, it took seven years to do this trial. 24 international research sites collaborated to find enough patients. How many patients did they study and how long did they study them? It was a two-year trial and it took seven whole years. So back to the Canadian Thoracic Society. 1,000 patients, five years, couldn't happen then, isn't going to happen now, is never ever going to happen. That's an important issue though because Canadian lung doctors are really familiar with their tools, their spirometry, their FEV1, and when we present them with better and more sensitive measurements, and I'm going to talk about lung density, they're mystified by it all. They're a little bit confused. Is there any other slide changer available? I, I, my thumb is fatiguing and it's, it's less responsive than my children, which is saying something. <laughs> uh, the um, um, uh, very important thing for you to know in a Canadian context is the Canadian Thoracic Society has come back to this issue. Many years later, they've gathered people together, and there's a long, long list of who that is up at the top, and there are in that list of people only a couple who are really involved in alpha, but these are all the wise lung doctors that have been asked to look through all the information and weigh it, discuss it, and come to some conclusions. And I want to point out that in 2012, this is what they said about augmentation therapy. There is evidence that prompts us to say people with alpha-1 lung disease, and they mention a specific degree of severity if your FEV1 is between 25 and 80 percent are predicted, Augmentation therapy needs to be considered. That's pretty straightforward. They went on to say, by the way, because of benefits in lung density, so they recognized that this lung density stuff was really pertinent. They didn't mention FEV1. And mortality. They recognized that people who get augmentation therapy for their alpha-1 lung disease actually live longer. Now, the... Um, really important study that's come out in the last couple of years is this study called the RAPID trial. And what I've put up here is the way it appeared in the journal called The Lancet. The Lancet is one of those very famous journals that you tend to hear about from time to time on the public news. The RAPID trial evaluated the intravenous treatment. There were two groups of patients, some who received it, some who received placebo. This was a blinded trial. And unlike 
something the Canadian Thoracic Society asked for, spirometry, it measured lung density, the sponginess that you saw in those two pictures. And this is what the rapid trial looked like. So if you can follow the study design, people were recruited and randomized, flip of the coin, to get alpha-1 protein. It's got a brand name there that we're not seeing in Canada, but just think of it as alpha-1 protein. And some people got placebo and received that for two years, once a week, intravenously. You notice at the bottom there were scans done. CT scans. Now I'll point out, by the way, if you've had a CT scan done, the picture that results would look something like those pictures at the bottom. But the scans that were done for this research study were very specifically done to measure, to quantify lung density for research purposes. So you couldn't go back to your doctor after this weekend and say, so what was my lung density in grams per liter? You'd mystify him or her and you'd mystify the radiologist. They're not still, they're not yet thinking in those terms. But those fancy research scans were basically CT scans with careful calibration that measured the density of that sponge. By the way, as in some of our current trials and as, as become commonplace, we recognize that people who came in over a two-year period to have CT scans to have intravenous treatment that was just placebo, really needed some reward. So there was an extension. And that was um, a period in which both groups then received active treatment. And that led to some very, very interesting lessons. And there's the update for today. I'm going to show you the results of that extension trial. So first of all, another graph. This is another graph of blood levels. There's the rapid trial, the two-year double-blind trial, the part that includes placebo. Then there's the next two years, which is a good part of the trial. Everybody gets treatment. And what you see is blood levels rise belatedly in the placebo-treated patients. They rise very quickly at the beginning of the trial. And we start talking about the early start group, the people who were lucky enough to get treatment for four years, and the delayed start group, people who got treatment, but not until a two-year interval had passed. So what we want to do is measure the sponginess. We want to preserve the density. What we're going to trace out here is, during the rapid trial, what happened to lung density? In people who tr were treated with placebo, lung density dropped, declined by more than two grams per liter per year. In people who received the intravenous treatment, the drop was much less, 1.5 grams per liter per year. By the way, some drop is inevitable. We do lose some density in our lungs with aging, and that's normal. How close this is to normal, I'm not quite sure, but the difference is a 33% reduction. And that's a significantly lower rate of lung density loss. People who receive the intravenous treatment are preserving more of that gas exchanging sponge that will see them through into old age. Now, by the way, the extension part is the new part, and it's finally been completed and analyzed. And you notice that people who start the treatment early continue to benefit, their rate of decline remains pretty constant. And an interesting thing happens when people start the treatment belatedly, their rate of decline slows down. But you'll also notice that there's no recovery of the lost lung function. So a delayed start means you're finally getting treatment, good things are starting to happen, the disease has been modified, but that delay meant that some of the sponginess, some of that gas exchanging area has been lost for good and we can't get that to recover. So by the way, if you're new to the idea of augmentation therapy, it's there to preserve what you've got. We're not expecting it to make what you've got any better than it is in terms of symptoms or lung function. Something else uh, we saw from the rapid trial and it becomes relevant, especially if you talk to Delila, when we consider some of the trials that are underway right now. What you're looking at are blood levels of alpha-1 protein. 
and on the y-axis the protective effect of um, lung density decline in the rapid trial. And what this graph says is when we modeled it out, it's interesting, the higher the blood levels, the better the protective effect. And we're starting to wonder if the amount of protein that we're using, that classic 60 milligrams per kilogram per week, is enough. And so underway right now is the SPARTA trial in which the Griffles company is examining the effect of not only the usual dosage of their augmentation therapy prolastin, but double the dosage of that augmentation therapy prolastin. And that's a trial that some of our patients in Ontario who don't have coverage are participating in so that they can receive some augmentation therapy. This is an important graph, and I know it looks, looks like a busy mishmash of dots. But if you look very carefully and read the little boxes up there, you're going to see something called p-values, meaning the relationship you're looking at is a significant one statistically. This is from the rapid extension trial, and it says those measurements that your doctor is comfortable with, FEV1, turn out after four long years to correlate, move in the same direction as changes in lung density. So if you remember, lung density measurements we wanted to make as a fancy research way of getting changes quantified quickly. And FEV1, we said, was that 200-year-old, very crude measurement technique, but one that doctors knew about. This finding says, guess what? You can now tell your doctor that those CT scan changes, they correlate, they move in the same direction as the much more familiar FEV1 measurement, and I think this is going to be really important to your doctors as they evaluate augmentation therapy. We can even talk about how much lung density change relates to how much FEV1 change. And by the way, just in case you track this stuff, one of the other measurements from spirometry is this thing called forced vital capacity, and it too, after four long years, starts to move in the same direction as lung density. And again, and then finally, if you've ever wondered about this, wait a minute, I understand my lung structure might break down if I don't have alpha-1 antitrypsin protection. Whatever happens to that lung tissue, it turns out there are some breakdown products. They're called desmazine, isodesmazine. You can impress your lung specialist with that stuff. And it turns out you can measure desmazine in the bloodstream and see how much of the lung tissue is being broken down. And there's a wonderful fellow called Jerry Torino working in New York City. He's 91 and is one of the leading figures in this field. He was there when Alpha-1 was first being described. And when the rapid trial was done, he said, can I have some of the blood samples, please? I'd like to see what the intravenous treatment does to break down products. I want to see if there's any effect. So what you're looking at is the breakdown products in red are the people getting placebo, and in blue, the people getting active treatment. And we have measurements at 3 months, 12 months, 24 months, and clearly there are some tissue breakdown products in people on placebo. There are far less tissue breakdown products, more protection in people who are getting intravenous treatment. And then, Remember, at the last two years, everybody gets active treatment and everybody starts to move in the same direction. Lower and lower levels of lung breakdown products with the intravenous treatment. So we've measured it now in several different ways, lung density, FEV1, breakdown products, and it's all moving in the same direction. What do these differences mean? I almost hesitate to talk about this in this room, but I'm I'm going to show you what I think was one of the most compelling findings from the rapid trial. And this actually appears in The Lancet if you want to go look it up and take it to your doctor and impress upon your doctor the importance of this augmentation therapy. We know that the average lung density in the people who entered the rapid trial was 46 grams per liter. Trust me, that figure will mean nothing to your family doctor, to your lung doctor. These are not measurements that doctors usually use. But that's where people in the rapid trial started on average. 
And during the rapid trial, six people had some bad outcomes. They either passed away or needed a transplant, which I guess isn't a bad outcome, but it means they had reached a sort of terminal point. Their lungs would no longer keep them going. That point was at about 20 or 21 grams per liter. And what this graph looks at is what happens if you don't have augmentation therapy? And the answer is that's the trajectory in years. And if you receive augmentation therapy, that's the trajectory. And the difference is about six years. So the average patient who had entered our rapid trial, if they had continued augmentation therapy for as long as possible, would have gained years of life. And it's the first time we've been able to talk in those terms, not just we think it works, we think the FEV1 is preserved or something fancy called lung density is preserved. We're now talking about years of life gained. And that's tremendous progress in that quarter of a century since Lorella and Erickson described this deficiency. I'm going to come back and tell you what I think are some of the lessons that you can take back to your own care, but I'm going to move on to some other territory. I'm going to step way back, talk about familiar treatments for COPD in general. This is an official slide. If I talk to lung doctors or family doctors, I have to show them the Canadian the RASC Society Guidelines for the Management of COPD. You know, this group looks very much at first sight of that graph the way most doctors do, which is something like that. <laughs> it, is, it is a tough thing to assimilate, but let me show you a little bit about what this means. All of these little cryptic bits of alphabet down here, those are the names of types of drugs. And what this general outline says is we will adjust our COPD treatment depending on whether the disease is mild or moderate or severe. And we might also have a little bit of a fudge factor depending on whether people are having those acute exacerbations of COPD, those bouts of bronchitis where folks get antibiotic and prednisone. And it is pretty complicated. And the truth is doctors don't really deal with all of the complex steps on that algorithm. So for example, I got to tell you, not many doctors are making a diagnosis of mild COPD, so we kind of drop that. Um, doctors don't read footnotes, God knows. Um, and when you talk about COPD, persistent disability is almost redundant, so we could probably drop that part. And when you start to look at it closely, what it says is for a long time now in Canada and around the world, doctors who deal with COPD or emphysema, the disease some of you are struggling with, Doctors have said, you know, we'd like to give a long-acting bronchodilator. Lama is something like Spiriva. Some of you may be taking that. Or a Laba, that's in the past been Cerevent or um, um, Oxy. Some of you may have been taking that. And it says that the next step, you'd probably combine those two things. Take them both together. Two bronchodilators, airway openers that work in different ways. And then finally, down here at the bottom, that thing, ICS, that's inhaled corticosteroid. We get there last. Inhaled steroids are really important in asthma, but you know, not so important in emphysema. In fact, we struggled for a long time to figure out if they would do anything. And the difference over here with frequent exacerbations of COPD is you get to all of that stuff pretty quickly, and then you start doing bizarre things like adding theophylline. Um, so um, that's what we've said we wanted to do, but in fact, in Canada, Everybody was missing the middle step, the two bronchodilators. And what happened in Canada and elsewhere was doctors would start with t -otropium, the scientific name for Spiriva. And if patients came back and weren't completely satisfied, they would get a combination inhaler of ICS LABA. And pretty soon people would be on all three drugs for their COPD. Two visits, three drugs. Uh, by the way, the names that you might recognize instead of those um, scientific names, Spiriva would be a common one, and at the next visit, Spiriva plus Advair or Spiriva plus Simbacort. If you're on one of those regimens, we're going to talk about it and talk about whether you really need to be on those regimens. By the way, sometimes the process was the reverse, the combination to begin with, and at the next visit of problems, there would be the addition of the teatropium. So it would be Advair or Simbacort, and at the next visit, the triple therapy. So. Let's talk about what these things do. 
Long-acting anti-muscarinic, that's Lama. That was by Riva for a long time. Let me show you what it does. Here's one of the original trials with teotropium, spirevia. Um, that other name there, iprotropium, that's Atrovent, a little spray inhaler, a little green one. And it had been around for 20 or 25 years. It opened up airways, but it didn't last very long. It had to be taken four times a day. This teotropium, everybody said, would last for an entire day. You only had to take it once. Oddly enough, this particular study that looks at lung function doesn't look at 24 hours, it only looks at six hours, but bear with me, there's still a lesson here. So what happens if you inhale this simple inhaler called Atrovent, that ancient one, and I'm sure people in the room have had it. Well, your lung function very gradually rises in about 45 to 60 minutes, and by the end of six hours of monitoring, it drops off. It's probably back to where its baseline will be. And you know, if you keep on doing that four times a day, and you come back on day eight and day 92, the measurements a week later, three months later, look the same. What about this teotropium stuff? Well, first thing is you have to be really patient. You start down there, the 45 minutes now becomes two hours. But you know, once you get your lung function up, the FEV1 up, it stays up there to the end of the six hours. And what's really interesting is when you come back a week later, it actually has boosted your baseline, that lowest breathing function level of the day. And doctors tend to look at that and call that trough FEV1, lowest FEV1 of the day. And if you wake up tight, that's what that's all about. And that works on day eight and day 92. Now. Who in the room cares about their FEV1? Eh, theoretically, maybe, but what you really want are benefits in terms of symptoms or not having flare-ups, these things called exacerbations. And this was one of the next big studies with this long-acting bronchodilator. If we open up those breathing tubes, can we keep people healthier? For example, in the VA system in the United States, can we keep them out of hospital? And the answer is in this graph where people are tracked over a year, yeah, randomization to placebo in this trial meant you were likely to drop out and land in the hospital. If you were lucky enough to take teotropium, you were much less likely to be hospitalized. So good things happen when airways opened, and that matches those guidelines that say, well, let's start with an airway opener, a bronchodilator. These llamas, long-acting antimuscarinics, look pretty good. One of the reasons why we haven't seen much of long-acting beta agonist use combined in Canada with long-acting antimuscarinics is because these have long been twice daily. Things like salmeterol or Cerevent had to be given twice daily. For Motorol, Oxys had to be given twice daily. But this is what they look like. There's 12 hours worth of FEV1 measurement. Lung doctors love FEV1, I warned you. There's the placebo treatment, not very satisfactory. Here's Atrovent, the short-acting agent, so you have to keep taking it. It does a temporary job. This, in its day, was pretty good. This is salmeterol or Cerevent, and it boosted the FEV1 for about 12 hours. Good news, and with that, you were likely to stay in the study longer, not be hospitalized or have an exacerbation. This is the likelihood of dropping out of the trial on placebo, on the short-acting airway opener, and there it is on the best airway opener or bronchodilator in that particular study. So again, opening up the airways seems to keep people healthier. But now we have long-acting beta agonists that can be given once daily, and there are several in Canada. One of them is studied as a standalone. It's called um, Onbreeze or Indicatorol. And again, you're looking at one of my familiar FEV1 curves. That's what goes up here on the y-axis. Here it is over four hours, and there's a placebo inhalation. There's this new stuff, and it works very quickly, unlike the older agents. That tends to be what we see with the newer agents. They tend to be quick onset, not always, but usually. And it lasts for four hours, and in fact, if we look a little more closely, that trough FEV1 the next morning, it's much, much better with the indicatorol versus placebo much, much better, the indicatorol versus placebo. 
So now we have a couple of once daily airway openers that really do their job well. Could we put them together? Before we get to that though, I want to talk about the inhaled steroids, the third component on that graph, the thing that doctors were getting to pretty quickly. When do we use inhaled steroids in COPD? And the answer is, you know, we struggled for a long time to see if there was anything inhaled steroids did, and for the longest while we, think we thought they were useless. But after a long time, we said those bouts of bronchitis, those exacerbations, if we do enough studies, if we add them all together, and carefully analyze the results, it turns out that there's a slight reduction in exacerbation rate of about 18%. And it tends to be in people who have relatively bad lung disease, people whose lung function, whose FEV1, is under about 50%. Well, nobody likes to have an exacerbation, so you might say, maybe we should just all take it anyway, just take that little reduction and, and run with it. In other words, any reason not to use inhaled steroids? And this is a funny question for me to answer the way I am about to answer it. For many years in my career, I spent a long time convincing patients with asthma that they really did benefit from inhaled steroids, and I still give that answer. But when it comes to COPD, we have to be a bit more careful because there are some downsides for relatively little benefit. So here's a different kind of graph. And here's Ken Chapman and when he was a fellow with us, Nick Hanania, doing some research in bones. Steroids can be tough on bones and we discovered that if we measured bone density and it's commonly measured at the lumbar spine, a place called the femoral neck, the hip, or Ward's triangle which is some mysterious place in the pelvis that only bone doctors know about. If we measured bone density and plotted it against the patient's average daily dose of inhaled steroid, the duration they'd been using it, corrected it for body size, look at that. The more inhaled steroid you use every day, the longer you use it, the lower is your bone density. That's our first observation of that. It's been replicated since, and it's a very robust finding. It's very relevant to COPD because if you look at doses of inhaled steroid as they increase across the x-axis, the risk of having a bone fracture, as described by these various studies, increases. A long, long time ago, 20 years ago, the New England Journal of Medicine reported a survey done in Australia. More than 28 puffs per week of inhaled steroid was associated with three times the risk of cataracts as compared to less than 14 puffs per week of inhaled steroid. And what's really caught our attention now in our aging population with COPD as people's immune systems become less robust is an increased risk of pneumonia. And this table is a summary table that says the odds ratio of having a pneumonia with your COPD is 1.60 if you have inhaled steroids as part of your treatment. 1.60, your chances of having pneumonia are 60% higher if you're taking inhaled steroids as part of your inhaler treatment for your COPD. Um, the folks in this province have said that when they look at the RAMQ database, the risk of a new diabetes diagnosis increases proportionately with the dose of inhaled steroids taken every day. In South um, Korea, they say the risk of developing tuberculosis where the disease is endemic increases as inhaled steroids get used in COPD. And they've actually found the same thing to a smaller extent in the Quebec RAMQ database. So we know that these agents, these inhaled steroids, have lots of effects, including some that damp down the immune system even further. So the current recommendation amongst lung specialist is the inhaled steroids, if they're going to be used, get used not routinely and not for everybody, but for people who are having bouts of bronchitis, people who are exacerbation prone. So call it getting an antibiotic a couple of times for winter when those coughs and colds settle on your chest, colored phlegm is coming up and you're more breathless. If that's going on two or more times a winter, that's exacerbation prone. How many people are exacerbation prone? Now, 
I'm not going to give you an alpha one figure. I'm going to give you a general figure. Here is something from a very large group of patients with COPD. It's called the Eclipse Trial, published in that uh, famous journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. And they did something very simple for one, two, and three years. They said, let's just keep track of people's flare-ups, their exacerbations. And they said, this funny buff color, that's going to be the people who have just one flare-up that year. Um, this orange-brown color, that's people who have two or more flare-ups. And in between, the gray one is people who have one flare-up. And they discovered that what you did in year one kind of predicted what was going to happen in year two and three. The more flare people who had two flare-ups in year one tended to do the same thing in the second and third years. People who had no flare-ups in the first year tended not to have flare-ups in the second and third year. This tendency is a fairly constant characteristic. And if we put numbers to it, we discover it's a minority of people with COPD who tend to get these flare-ups, meaning we should probably use these inhaled steroids in just a few of our patients. So in fact, many of us are taking our patients off the inhaled steroid if they don't need them. So here's another famous trial, and again from the New England Journal of Medicine, the wisdom trial if you're taking notes. And what you're looking at is a graph that describes over 54 weeks the time it takes people with COBD to have a flare-up. Who were these people? These were all people with severe to very severe COPD. They'd all had exacerbations before, and they had all started this trial on triple therapy. So in this case, it was Advair and Spireva. And the doctors in the trial said, at random, some of you will continue your ICS, your inhaled steroid. But some of you, and we're going to be very tricky about it, you won't know who you are, we're going to gradually withdraw and stop your inhaled steroid. You're just going to end up on two airway openers. And look, they ended up in the same place with the same number of exacerbations. Dropping the inhaled steroid hadn't done anything. So a lot of us are doing that in our patients who are not at much risk of flare-ups. Instead, we're using bronchodilators. We're often combining them and we're often giving them once daily. So we're back to my graphs of FEV1. This is a trial called the SPARK trial over 64 weeks. Patients who got one airway opener, like a peronium that's currently known by the trade name Cebri, or teotropium, that's the old Spireva stuff, their trough FEV1 got better. That's one bronchodilator. What if instead of inhaling one bronchodilator, they inhaled this QVA149, that's actually the early research code name for Ultibro, the combination of a LABA and a LAMA, two bronchodilators working differently. And the answer is lung function is even better. One inhalation, better results. Does it make a difference? Well, we'd like to know if that makes a clinical difference if there are fewer flare-ups. And that is something that's pretty likely because we know if we compare the two bronchodilators, to something simple like Advair, we see better lung function with the two bronchodilators than with the older medication that's twice daily that's been around for a long time. So if you ask doctors in the lung field what's new, we published in May what's called the FLAME study. It was a comparison of this dual bronchodilator approach, the Ultibro approach, a LABA and a LAMA, an airway opener, no inhaled steroid versus Salmeterol fluticasone, and that's the fancy generic name for Advair 500. Over the course of a year, there were fewer flare-ups on the two bronchodilators, no inhaled steroid in sight. This is what it looked like in the New England Journal. We could add up the mild flare-ups, 16% lower risk of mild, moderate, and severe flare-ups with the two bronchodilators a 22% lower likelihood of moderate or severe exacerbations, and a 19% lower likelihood of the severe exacerbations. It was a pretty robust trial, and the lung function was definitely better. The breathing felt better in people on the two bronchodilators compared to the traditional ICS LABA. By the way, this is a tally of symptom burden, and it, in the blue, was always lower towards the end of the trial in people who took the two bronchodilators. Pneumonia occurred more often in the people who got Advair. 
So I'm just going to list now some of the medicines and I'll pause here. The trend I hope I described was we're getting very suspicious about inhaled steroids. We're using them less and less often. We're really keen on getting back to our roots, which was to emphasize the bronchodilator. Now, newer is not always better, but one thing is the newer agents tend to be once daily. Certainly that's got to be convenient. And in many cases, these newer compounds are even more effective. So in terms of LABA, there's one new one called OnBreeze. In terms of LAMA, there are two new ones and one revised by Riva in a new inhaler. The combinations that I was talking so much about, there are three of them here. Anoro, Inspiolto, Ultibro, you saw the data for Ultibro. That's really the foundation that lung doctors are aiming for now. And then there's a new inhaled steroid combination called Brio. There's, some new, there's a couple of newer twice daily agents, something called Tudorza, something called do a clear. They're not really completely new agents. Uh, there's an older LABA in that. So my suggestion is have a look at that and think about whether you're taking your medicines once daily or twice daily, whether or not there's an inhaled steroid in the mix, and if so, do you know why there's an inhaled steroid in the mix? Are you on the latest of medications to inhale for your emphysema or COPD? <coughs> so what's a patient to do? And I want to come up with two general lines of recommendation. One, augmentation therapy, that intravenous treatment. I know it's not covered for everybody everywhere, but scientifically speaking, medically speaking, speaking as the Canadian Thoracic Society statement said in 2012, this stuff works. It slows the progression of emphysema in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and it prolongs life. And we can actually put some numbers to that now. If your respiratory specialist hasn't discussed this with you, um, I'm going to be blunt about it, you need to find a new respiratory specialist. I am just gobsmacked that I see patients who've been followed by a lung specialist for years who don't know that augmentation therapy exists. They have never heard about it. That is just appalling. Your lung specialist doesn't have to be expert in it, doesn't have to prescribe it, doesn't have to understand it, because not everybody's expert in everything. But your lung doctor, if your lung doctor's doing a job, needs to make you aware of it. And if it's a potential therapy, needs to refer you to somebody who understands it. What's a patient to do? And I'm going to talk about the COPD things. It's quite clear that only a minority of patients with COPD really need inhaled steroids. And that's an important thing to know because inhaled steroids do come with a bit of a downside and we may not want to give them if they're not doing a job. So do you know if you're taking inhaled steroids as part of your treatment? Figure that one out. And if you are, do you know why? And it could be because you're having lots of flare-ups. Well, that might be reasonable. Or it could be because your particular picture of alpha-1 is a bit more asthma-like with allergies and variable lung function and inhaled steroids may be very appropriate. But if you've got a more typical sort of emphysema picture and you're not having a lot of flare-ups, maybe you don't need the inhaled steroid. And by the by, are you on one of the newer inhaled agents? It's not newness for the sake of newness. Once a day is an important advantage. A more potent chemical inside is also an important advantage. You know, you are a much better audience than most doctors. Um, it's really impressive. Um, and, and I have a feeling because it's so important to you, you're going to take more away. So I'm going to be around later on today. And there are also lots of other smart people. Um, a good chunk of the research I was describing um, was uh, uh, put together by the fellow sitting back there, Jean Bourbeau. And he's going to be back later talking about uh, lung disease for alphas as well. And I'm going to put him on the spot and make sure that lots of people ask him questions in the breaks. Thank you very much. Chapman, um, did you have a minute to, to take I a certainly couple have. questions? Does anyone have a question for Dr. Chapman before we move on this morning? Excuse me. Morning, I'm Isabel. I work in Ottawa and I'm a chronic disease self-management nurse. 
I was wondering your, um, when you were talking about inhaled corticosteroids not really being needed unless it's an exacerbation, how much of the primary care physicians are aware of that? Um, I think that's new information, sorry, there, just to repeat the question in case you didn't hear it, um, how many primary care doctors are aware that inhaled steroids are not routinely to be used in COPD? And the answer is, I think that's new information from them, for them. I think that most of them are quickly getting to triple therapy with the familiar agents, and the classics would be Spireva plus either Advair or Simbacort. Um, this new information is coming out slowly. It takes a while to change practice. But when I lecture about COPD and talk about these trends, I often use the title Back to the Future, because if you go back to the COPD literature of 20 years ago, we focused on bronchodilators and we did some studies and saw the use of inhaled steroids in COPD and lamented the use. Um, and what's happened in the last 10 or 15 years with inhaled steroid use routinely is really quite an aberration. Another question? Yes. A uh, question I got, I got three grandkids, four, five, and six and they have been diagnosis with ZZ, what would you recommend uh, in the future for those three kids? Um, the oh, question... Oh, the, oh, their <laughs> <right there. laughs> the, the, the question of... of um, let me talk first about the lung disease. Certainly those kids need to uh, uh, be lifelong non-smokers and those kids um, certainly need to be steered away perhaps from jobs that expose them to lots of respiratory irritants. Firefighter might be cute when the grandkids are three, but firefighter may not be the best of occupations for somebody with alpha-1. So those are general protective principles. Now what do we do about um, monitoring and diagnosing? And I think that uh, the development of emphysema is very, very slow. And if the kids are not having any unusual breathing problems, chest problems, um, I think that one would start to measure their lung function, their breathing function with ordinary breathing tests when they can do them, which is at about age seven or eight, and every few years after that. Things would change if those kids start to have some symptoms. So if those kids had asthma, bouts of bronchitis, pneumonia, I would definitely want that looked at more closely, and I'd like to involve an alpha-1 expert in their follow-up. Um, again, very few doctors out in the community, even specialists, know much about this disease. Um, and the goal of it would be to detect any pattern of rapid development of emphysema. And again, everybody's alpha is different. Some people who are ZZ will not show much in the way of lung changes until they're in their 70s, and some people show them quite early. Some of that is obviously exposures and tobacco smoking. And the rest of it is the rest of the genetics that we're too witless to understand. All we know is the alpha-1. So we hope those three grandkids have some really robust and protective genetics other than alpha-1. But I guess the big message is they need to be followed. And any pattern that suggests anything in the lungs they definitely need to be followed by somebody who knows something about alpha. There was a question over there, yes. I think. Yes. Well, the, the move towards uh, bronchodilators as opposed to uh, a, a bronchodilator and a steroid component, uh, for those that do have, say, a bronchial in impact, is there any evidence that there are any alternate treatments or that could be used instead of taking the steroid? for someone with a tendency to have exacerbations and bronchial infections? I could blather on for another hour. People would start passing out at the tables. <laughs> yes is the answer. And I think one of the problems has been doctors have really dumbed down therapy. Um, and I, I really wasn't joking. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Doctors start with their favorite inhaler and patients return in the next visit. There's the next inhaler and bang, people are on triple therapy and it's a bit mindless. And after that, the blinkers go on. So, for example, a frequent exacerbation might mean that you have bronchiectasis, the dilatation of the airways, and you're not clearing mucus. And instead of an inhaled steroid, which only makes chronic colonization or infection with germs worse, maybe what somebody needs is 
mucus clearing procedures, things like physiotherapy, that was the old style, or one of those newer mobilizing devices, aerobica or ervo or something like that that helps move secretions. But to get there, doctors have to stop dumbing it down to, I've given you three inhalers, what else do you need? To, okay, let's think about what's really going on and treat that specifically. It may be specific antibiotic therapy. It may be finding chronic infection with something we're seeing more and more of, at least in Ontario, and that is non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection. That's a fancy sort of germ that's sort of in the TB family, lingers for a long time, and is really tough to treat if it gets a foothold. We're seeing more of it, my colleagues now tell me, because of the inhaled steroid binging we've been doing. So the quick answer to your question, yeah, there's lots of other stuff to do, and we need to get doctors out of that rut, that mindset that once they prescribe triple therapy, their job is done. We need somebody to take some extra time and think it through. There's lots of stuff to be looked at. Thank you. Gary has a question. Hi, doctor. Uh, I'm a ZZ as well, and uh, looking at your uh, research paper on how people dropped off, and then when they got on uh, uh, augmentation therapy, the angle changed, and then with the late start, the angle changed. See, I told you this is a better audience than doctors. Doctors would be just zoned out at that point <laughs> of the talk, wouldn't have remembered it. I well, don't... my question is, um, in one of the slides you said that augmentation therapy is for people from 25% to 80%. I'm one of the extremely lucky people in the room that my FEV1 is in the high 90s. So why not, if you're above 80%, give you the augmentation uh, prophylactically so that you're not going to start going down that slide. Why not start pushing the, the, the end zone earlier in your, your lifespan till, instead of waiting till you're and it's, at the end? The answer to that, why not just start, or, or maybe even routinely, is, well, it's pretty intrusive, um, and it's pretty expensive, and it's a scarce resource. Only about, it, it's fewer than half of people who are ZZ who are going to develop important lung disease. So why expose 50% you know, of that population to a treatment they won't ever really need? Um, and it goes back to that answer that I was giving about grandkids. Some people will be in their 70s before we start to measure anything at all. Maybe one of the other numbers you can carry away from this meeting is, um, we should have Francois here and, uh, talking about rehab, but one of the things I learned was at maximum exercise, if we do an exercise test with you and on a treadmill and so on, the thing that stops people is not their breathing capacity if they're healthy, it's their heart. The heart can't pump any more blood to exercising muscles. At that point, you are at 70% of your breathing capacity. So turn that around, you could lose 5%, 10%, 15%, 30% lung capacity and theoretically still go out there and become an Olympic athlete. So if you're above 90, yeah, okay, I, I want to keep you there, but you know, if you drop to 85, it's not the end of the world. 80, 75, I'm okay. And then at that point, if you're showing a trend, yeah. Thank you. There's a question. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, uh, Rosario from Ottawa. Uh, why some patients, COPD patient, has taken from the combination therapy, the corticosteroids and the lava, and put in an asthma medication? Only asthma, like asthma next. Um, and uh, sorry, this is for the treatment of alpha one or the treatment of COPD. COPD. <laughs> COPD. Um, I'm surprised at a treatment that's only inhaled steroids in COPD, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's part of anybody's algorithm, so that's odd. But I will say, coming back to alpha, there are some people with alpha, it's 20 or 25 percent, who are never smokers, very allergic, early in the disease they have lots of airway, we would say twitchiness or bronchodilator response, and, and um, um, the bronchodilator response tells us that they really have asthma and their ongoing injury isn't so much a smoking injury as it is an asthma inflammation injury. And those people might get a pure asthma treatment focused on inhaled steroids. So it does depend on your pattern of alpha, but if your pattern is COPD, bronchodilators are really where it's at. Mm -hmm. By the way, Sean, I know how to be on call today and he's gonna be coming back later. It, uh, 
He wasn't trying to sneak away from your questions. <laughs> Remember, write them down. He, he loves questions. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Thank you. Thank you.